So now, yeah, it's already time. So are you ready for? Yeah, 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 whatever. <laughs> Let me start. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, we begin the APCP string seminar in 2022. Uh, let me uh, introduce the today's speaker, Samuel Rosenger from MIT. Uh, today, he will talk about the very interesting his recent work on the you know, emergent time in holographic dual uh, holographic duality. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Samuel. Uh, th thanks very much for for the for the introduction, and th thanks very much for the for the inv invitation. Um, I'm excited today to be talking about um, some, some recent work that, I, that I've been doing with my advisor, um, Hong Lu at MIT. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll sort of dive into the, the motivation now. Um, so, oh, let me just make sure, there we go. Um, so there's, uh, there's, there's sort of a, a fundamental problem of, of time in, in quantum gravity that arises because there's a difference between how we talk about time in quantum mechanics and how we talk about time in general relativity. So usually in general relativity, if we're looking at some generic solution to the Einstein equations, there's usually no preferred slicing of that space time. Um, so there's a sense in which time is meaningless. We can change what we mean by time by doing some gauged diffeomorphism um, within the space time. Um, and by changing that slicing, um, we can't say that one particular you know, choice of time is better than any other. And then this is very different from the situation in quantum mechanics where, where time is absolute. In quantum mechanics, you know, we're given a Hamiltonian and we solve the Heisenberg equations of motion. Um, and there's an absolute notion of time that's underlying that quantum mechanical system. Um, and so there's, uh, in, in, in trying to you know, talk about the, the issue of time and quantum gravity, we have to come to terms with this difference um, between the two different theories. Um, and there's an intermediate case where we can hope to make some progress. And that's in the case of these asymptotically anti de Sitter space times. In those kinds of space times, there's an absolute asymptotic time. Um, and famously, this is you know, the time that, that under, underlies the CFT in the ADS CFT duality. Um, and so, what I mean by this is that um, you know, the diffeomorphisms that we need to gauge by in general relativity, they have to vanish at, at, the, at the spatial, at the boundary. And because they have to vanish at the boundary, we can't change what we mean by the asymptotic time. And in this sense, there's an absolute time. So once we have this absolute time in the, in the asymptotically ADS case, um, there's a natural question, which is, can we extend this time into the bulk and get a foliation of the entire space time? Um, and there, there's a simple answer to this question. Um, if the bulk has a, has a global time-like killing vector. So if there's a global time-like killing vector, then there's a natural way to use that, that symmetry um, to extend this time into a foliation of your space time. But in the case where, you're, where your space time doesn't have such a, such a killing vector, it doesn't have that kind of symmetry, the answer is not clear. Um, and so the simplest example of, of, of these sort of issues um, is, is, um, is found in the eternal ADS black hole. Um, so here I'll draw the Penrose diagram of an eternal ADS black hole with the boundaries here on the outside, the singularity is drawn as these red wavy lines, and then we have these horizons here in orange. Um, and so if, uh, if we take you know, the CFT time, so we imagine here H right is some CFT time operator evolving up in time on this side, and H left would evolve you up in time on this side. If we take this kind of generator and we extend, uh, the, we extend the foliation into the bulk using the, using the killing vector that we have outside of the horizon, then we get slices that look like this. So if we evolve from this flat slice here, we'll end up at this angled slice like this. Um, and similarly, um, we, we could hope to, to use an operator like this, where we take the sum of the two generators. And when we evolve by, um, when we evolve by, by those generators and we extend using the symmetry into the bulk, we'll get some slice that looks like this V that, we've, um, that we extend to in that case. And so importantly, those kind of slices, they, they go through the bifurcation surface and they never see the interior of the black hole. And so uh, in, in this work, what we're interested in is how do we describe in a diffeomorphism invariant way, this kind of evolution from a slice that looks like this to one that sees inside the horizon. Um, 
And so to go a little bit further, um, we'll be talking about this problem in the context of the ADS-CFD duality. Um, and so famously in 2001, Maldesena told us that if we want to describe this eternal ADS black hole, that should be described by two copies of your holographic CFT in, entangled in the thermal field double state. Um, and so if we look at the bulk side of this picture, we notice that we have this time-like killing vector outside the horizon. Um, so this natural extension of the CFT time into the bulk, um, we have that, we can use the killing vector to extend it to this flow outside the horizon. But that time actually ends at the horizon. We hit T is minus infinity here and T is plus infinity here. So we can't probe the interior using that time. And in, in this work, we're interested in understanding where do those interior regions come from? How do we describe infalling observers? Um, and, uh, and a little bit of how do we describe interactions of left and right observers who can meet in this future interior region. Um, so there's many features, many interesting features of this bulk geometry uh, that are not so easy to see just from this, this boundary picture um, that we have on this side. So that's, that's the mot motivation for the talk. So now I'll give a quick outline of, of uh, what, what, what we'll talk about today. So um, first I'll give a description of, of the main results of our work. Then I'll review um, very quickly entanglement in quantum field theory um, from the perspective of local algebras of observables. And then I'll introduce a structure called half-sided modular inclusion uh, that we'll use uh, in the third part of the talk to talk about the construction of infalling times from the boundary perspective. And then finally, I'll finish with a bit of a discussion. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, all, all of these results are worked with Hong Lu at MIT um, and it appeared in these uh, two papers. Um, Great. So I'll just pause for a couple seconds in case there are any questions at this point. Great. Um, so first, um, our first, our, our main result is concerning the, the boundary description of these infalling observers. So in particular, uh, what we found is that in the boundary theory, there exists evolution operators that, that look as follows. So there's a one parameter unitary group um, you know, obtained by this exponentiation of this uh, anti-Hermitian operator here. Here, um, G is some Hermitian generator. Um, and that generator has the following properties. It involves degrees of freedom from the left and the right CFT. It's positive semi-definite. And importantly, if we consider a bulk field operator at some point X that lies in the right region, the right exterior of that black hole geometry, if we evolve by these, these boundary evolution operators, we find some operator capital phi that has support in the future interior region, so long as we evolve by sufficiently large value of this parameter S. Oh, yes. Uh, hello? Hello? Oh, hi. I, oh, I want hi. to ask one question. When you say that the, the boundary theory can help the evolution operators, what is the boundary theory? Do you mean the conformal field theory or any quantum field theory satisfy the Bonnyman algebra? Ah, yes. So, so, um, so here, so here, I have have in mind something like, uh, yeah. I, so, I have in mind a, a conformal field theory um, that this is is most clear, I guess, in, in the case of uh, like something like n equals four super Yang Mills, um, a matrix, a theory with matrix degrees of freedom, um, and, and what we'll see is that. Um, yeah, what we'll see later later in, in the talk is that that these these sort of matrix theories with matrix degrees of freedom, um, they have a, a special subset of operators that allows us to describe this evolution. So it's not just any conformal field theory that can do this. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, and the warm up of this uh, inequality is G is greater than zero. So is it really mandatory or is it like a does it mean it has some lower bound or should it be really zero or like that? Oh, um, so so it's just important that it, that it's bounded below. Um, um, in, but, uh, um, should it be zero or it could be some some particular some constant? Like, uh, so here G is greater than zero. I think you mean that the eigenvalue of the G is positive, not negative. But uh, some case, uh, Hermitian, like it could be uh, bounded below so that it's greater than, for example, minus one or minus two. But uh, is there some problem of the, this uh, 
when minimum is minus one? Or? No, so so there wouldn't be uh, there wouldn't be any problem if, if if the minimum was minus one. It just needs to be bounded below. Um, and uh, but what we'll find is the explicit construction of the operator we'll give is actually bounded below by zero. Yeah. Uh, I, in the, in the like example, or in this particular example, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. yeah, we'll give a, a general construction, and mm -hmm. all of the generators that you can get in this way have that property that they're bounded below by zero. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, so, so okay. So, so why are these properties of the generator something that that we might be interested in? Um, and so, so the first thing is that the the fact that G is bounded below, in, in our case by zero, this distinguishes the parameter S as as a time parameter. So, in particular, um, you know, if you contrast this with something like the generator of an internal symmetry or a spatial displacement, those operators are not bounded from below. Um, and, and so this, this positive semi-definite um, property is what distinguishes this flow as, a, as sort of a time-like flow. Um, and then crucially, this third point demonstrates that this flow that we're, we've constructed is actually describing infalling observers. If you start with an observer, you know, an operator in the right exterior, we find you know, when we evolve by positive values of S, they end up in the future interior region. Um, and so this is the sense in which it's an infalling observer. Um, and so in particular, Finding these evolution operators U of S allows us to generate the interior regions from the exterior regions. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, it means that we can go from this picture here on the left to this picture on the right, where um, you know, we have the full Penrose diagram of the maximally extended you know, ADS black hole um, with the future and past regions. Um, and so, yeah, so in particular, if we start with operators only, you know, only in the left exterior or only in the right exterior of the black hole, there's a, you know, been for many years, a reconstruction uh, formulas have been known on how to construct those operators on these, on these um, boundaries, um, on their respective boundaries. But what this U of S allows us to do is take those operators in those two exterior regions and evolve them into the future and past interior regions. Um, and one thing uh, that, that we find is uh, we'll give a general construction of U of S. Um, and and in, in fact, there are many, many choices that you can make for this U of S. So there are many different ways of, of, of getting this evolution that takes you into the interior. Um, um, and so, yeah, we'll find that as, as a result of this calculation. Um, great. Um, and, and so, so the, the, the situation in which things can be done very, very explicitly, the most explicitly, is in this simple case of the BTZ black hole. So this is a three-dimensional black hole um, in which we can compute this operator U of S explicitly. And so what do we find? Um, so with this, uh, this capital Phi here being the evolved bulk field operator, we find that there's some critical parameter S naught, which is some positive value such that the following happens. If we evolve Phi by a small value of S less than S naught, then we find that that operator is only supported on right CFT degrees of freedom, um, simply you know, signaling that it's still in this right exterior region. Whereas once we cross that value S naught uh, by evolving by larger values of the parameter, we're in the future interior region. And we find that that operator now contains degrees of freedom both in the left CFT and in the right CFT. Um, and so this is a, a, a signature of the, of the sharp horizon um, yeah, that we see in the bulk. Is it exact statement or some certain some approximation like uh, when s is less than s zero, it's sharply like uh, exactly belong to the CFT R, but uh, after s zero or like up to some one over n or one e to the minus n exponentially suppressed term. Is right. Yes. Yeah, so 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 for what I'm describing, yeah, one thing I should have mentioned is 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 we're we're always going to be working at, at leading order in in the one over n expansion of of the um, of the boundary theory or the or the G Newton expansion of the bulk, um, and um and 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 in that in that case, yeah, these are exactly zero. So this this operator phi is supported only on on right CFT operators before. Um, and after this value of the critical value, then it then it can have um, a non-zero support on left CFT operators. So so this is so, uh, something that I might say a couple times in the talk. But we call this that there's a sharp horizon. It's exactly zero before and then non-zero after this critical value. Great, great. Oh yeah, okay, good. <laughs> um, and and so um, 
and so and so now to to see what the flow looks like um, in, in a different way, I'll, I'll introduce the BTZ Kruskal diagram. So here U and V are going to be the Kruskal null coordinates. So working from the outside in, these black curves are the boundaries, the asymptotic boundaries. Then we have the right and the left interior regions, and then you can cross the horizon into the future and past interior regions. And finally, the spacetime ends at this red line here, the singularity. Great. So now that we have that diagram, what does what does the evolution look like? Well, it looks it looks as follows. So the first thing is that if I start with a bulk field operator very very near the past horizon, then I find that this evolution is a pure Kruskal U translation. It's just a null translation along this Kruskal U coordinate. Um, if I start finitely far from that from that past horizon, just at some generic point uh, in the right exterior, then we find that the operator spreads, but it still remains an operator um, entirely supported in this right exterior region until we we um, evolve by the parameter that is the Kruskal coordinate, the Kruskal U coordinate distance to the horizon. So you know, in this exterior region, this Kruskal U is negative. Um, so if we evolve by this positive value, more than this positive value of S, then we start seeing support in the future interior region. Um, and one thing that we, we noticed, even though um, that evolution was non-local, even though the operator spreads for, for starting with a generic point outside the horizon, um, the causal structure of the black hole spacetime is respected. Um, so if we, we start with this operator here, phi right, um, and we evolve, that operator is spreading out sort of schematically shown by this shaded region. Um, and what we find is that if we want its commutator with some operator in the left exterior to become non-zero, not only do we have to evolve by this amount U1 to cross the horizon, we also need to evolve into that future light cone of the left operator. So, so even though we have this, this non-local spreading, there's still, um, there's still uh, this causal structure is, is recovered. Um, and things get things get the clearest um, when we take the limit of having a large mass of the bulk field. So now, if we take our bulk field operators to be a field of a very large mass, um, and we average over these boundary spatial directions, so in the BTZ case, that's just averaging over the circle. Um, then we find that this evolution localizes everywhere in the bulk. So not just near the past horizon. In fact, if we start with any point in the right exterior, we get a pointwise transformation. Um, and we can find we can find this uh, field operator following some trajectory into the interior. Um, and so in Kruskal coordinates, the tra trajectory is, is given by this. Um, so we have yeah, this operator is, is found to be at the point x sub s after being evolved from the point x naught by amount s. Um, and so the, the, the specific coordinate transformation, it looks like this. And that's easiest just to visualize on that Kruskal diagram. So here, um, here on the left, I'm showing that uh, the trajectory is followed by these bulk field operators. So if we start uh, again, if we start very near the past horizon, it's a pure Kruskal U translation. That's true in any case. Um, but now in the large mass limit, we find that the evolution localizes um, everywhere else, uh, no matter where we start in this right exterior. So here we start in the right exterior, uh, cross the horizon into the future interior, and then eventually hit the singularity. Um, and on the right here, this is exactly the picture of the, of the kind of evolution we were talking about in the very beginning of the talk. So if we start from this Kruskal time is zero slice and we evolve by a positive value of S, we end up at Cauchy surfaces that look like this that probe the interior of the black hole. And so this is the, the kind of evolution we were interested in. Similarly, if we evolve by a negative value of S, we'll probe the past interior. Great. And the final, uh, the final result I'd like to mention is something we called causal connectability. And this is sort of the pure boundary interpretation um, uh, of, of this bulk structure. Yes, yes. Question, uh, what do you mean large mass limit compared to what? Ah, yes, sorry. Um, yes, so this, so that's when this, this. Uh, so so this, um, yeah, so at, in the leading order, this, this bulk field um, phi is a free field in the bulk um, of, of, some, of some mass. And so it's in the limit that that mass is much larger than uh, one over the ADS length. Um, the, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, great. Um, and uh, so here, what is time? I mean, S for the this singularity. So here, it's ah, the singularity. Yes. So 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 these 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 the field operators hit the singularity at some finite value of S of the parameter S. 
um, okay, is there some yeah. particular here? The, your construction looks like it's very important to capture the horizon, but the, how about the similarity? Uh, what is it some? Right. So, so uh, yeah. So, so yeah. What I'll say is the singularity is still a mystery to us. Um, we, um, we, we, when we do this, um, yes. Yeah, so when I when I write this evolution here, um, there's this proportionality factor here that it's a pointwise transformation, but the normalization is actually changing, um, and that 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 factor um, that factor vanishes at the singularity. Um, but if you if you just forgot about this this bulk operator phi, um, this uh, yeah then um, th this this operator capital phi appears to be perfectly well defined crossing through the singularity, um, and so and so we we didn't see um, a sharp singular a sharp signature of the singularity. We think this has something to do with the fact that the that the um, that the evolution is is non-local um, in the finite mass case um, that sort of weakens the signature of the singularity, and then at the level to which we worked in this large mass limit, you actually find that the that the the signature of the singularity is subleading um, in in that large mass limit. Um, <laughs> yeah, which is a bit counterintuitive. But yeah, <laughs> that's yeah that's what we found. So the the singularity is still a mystery to us. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Um, right. So the final uh, the final um, result I'll mention is, is something called causal connectability, which is the pure boundary interpretation of our results. So for this, um, we imagine that we're able to simulate quantum gravity in the lab. So we can take two labs that have um, you know that have their complicated their qu complicated quantum systems that are simulating some conformal field theories. And then we want to ask the question: How would we decide that you know that if there was a holographic dual um, of those CFTs, how would we just uh, decide that that holographic dual has an emergent horizon structure? So that's exactly what causal connectability is. It's just a proposal for a criterion on how to decide there there's an emergence of a horizon and an associated causally connected bulk spacetime um, phrased entirely from the boundary perspective. And so it's just exactly the existence of those evolution operators, U, U of S, that have that positive semi-definite generator, such that we can find operators in the left and right theories, such that the following commutator structure is possible. For a finite value of the parameter, the commutator remains zero up until S naught, and then it becomes non-zero um, after crossing that. And so this is just sort of the, the boundary reflection of that emergent horizon structure. So here you is some kind of operation in the that you can perform in the lab, right? Right. Yeah. So here you would have to have be simulating two entangled CFTs and then evolving them with some sort of interaction Hamiltonian such that you can get the structure. And uh, this U is uh, the operator which live in the both the CFT lab, then right? It's not the one. one yes, it has. Yes, it has to live in both both uh, the left and right CFTs. Yes, yeah. So I just wonder, like, the, there was some work on the, this Python's logic. So there is like a restricted complexity and uh, unrestricted uh, complexity, which means that you can some observer in the right, the CFT on the right can only perform the like uh, some experiment on the right CFT. So that the, uh, so here oh. you is uh, the operation on the both side. So it's in the black rate right kind of, uh, there is no such observable on the user observable, uh, observable or, and uh, let me discuss later. So yeah, sorry, go ahead. I will ask okay, you. great. Yeah, 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 that, yeah, that sound, sounds great. Um, yeah, I would say cer certainly, um, yeah, certainly in, in this discussion, I haven't thought about complexity at all. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, great, great. Um, so, that, so that was sort of the, the end of, of the results. And so now, um, if there aren't any more questions, I'll, I'll go and talk a little bit about entanglement and quantum mechanics and how do we actually construct these operators. Okay, thank you. Great, great, thanks. Um, Okay, so first I'll do a very quick review of how do we talk about entanglement in quantum mechanics. So when we talk about entanglement in quantum mechanics, 
we imagine having a bipartite quantum system that has some left and right Hilbert space that are combined together with this tensor product structure into the larger Hilbert space. And then acting on those Hilbert spaces, we have the left and right operator algebras, just the, the operators, you know, a bounded operator algebras acting on H left and on H right. And then we can take a global state psi, which lives in this large tensor product Hilbert space. And from that psi, there's, you know, we can take the, um, we can take the density operator and the partial trace to construct these reduced density matrices, row left and row right, which are just some elements of these left and right operator algebras. And then from that procedure, um, we can we can um, we can construct the von Neumann entropy, which is this just you know this particular um, this particular functional of this of this uh, reduced density matrix row right, um, and so so there's all the all these structures that we do in quantum mechanics, um, and and a final thing that we don't talk about quite as much is um, is if the state psi is very highly entangled. That, that's the only case in which row left and row right will be will both be full rank. The state needs to be very highly entangled. And in this highly entangled case, we can then define the modular flow. And the modular flow is just an automorphism on the algebras, algebra of operators on the quantum system defined in this way. We take some operator delta and raise it to the power IT and conjugate that operator here. Um, and in, in this tensor factorized case, Delta is just given by this product of reduced density matrices, row left times row right inverse. Um, and I should say, yeah, these are acting on row left acting only on the left factor and row right acting only on the right factor. Um, great. Yeah, when you say full rank, what do you mean by that? Uh, uh, so I mean, yeah, as uh, th these row left and row right, they're, they're, they're um, they're supported. They have non-zero eigenvalues on a complete basis of the left and right Hilbert spaces. Um, each as maybe, yeah. yeah, each Hilbert. Yeah. Okay. yeah, on each Hilbert space. Yeah, like so. In the finite dimensional case, they'll they'll be matrices, and uh, they'll be matrices that um, are invertible. Um, yeah, yeah. Great. Um, uh, right, and uh, and one thing to notice from this factorized form of delta here, um, for example, if I took a a to be some operator only in the right um, only in the right copy, you know, only in the right Hilbert space, then um, row left would just cancel right through because it would commute with a, and we would remain with an operator only in the in the right uh, Hilbert space, and so this modular flow sort of preserves the left and right algebras. Great. So there's all this structure that we have in quantum mechanics, but in relativistic quantum field theory, um, a lot of this structure doesn't survive. So here, what I've pictured is the Rindler decomposition of Minkowski space, where we, you know, we have a left, right, future, and past uh, Rindler wedges. And in particular, in quantum field theory, there do not exist those Hilbert spaces. There does not exist a left Hilbert space and a right Hil Hilbert space on which the fields localized in those regions can act. And there are also not reduced density matrices for the left and right uh, for the left and right um, theories, and there's no finite, well-defined entanglement entropy for this left and right theories. But what does survive is the modular operator. So even in this case of relativistic quantum field theory, um, in this Rindler decomposition, the modular operator and modular flow still exist. So what does this mean? Um, this lack of many familiar quantum mechanical concepts, but the existence of the modular flow is telling us that actually all states in the Hilbert space are highly entangled. They're simply all the states in the Hilbert space are highly entangled between the left and the right Rindler regions. And this reflects a fundamental difference between the local operator algebras in quantum mechanics and those in relativistic quantum field theory, which is neatly summarized by the von Neumann, uh, by von Neumann's classification of these so-called von Neumann algebras of observables, um, in quantum mechanics we have type one von Neumann algebras. These are like the the full operator algebras on some Hilbert space, whereas in relativistic quantum field theory we have these sort of more mysterious algebras that are called type three one von Neumann algebras. And so it's not too important what the definition of these objects are. Um, but what, what we'll see is that in order to have this sort of emergent flow, uh, we'll need these sort of type three one von Neumann algebras. Great. What is the big difference? Like a, like a finite dimension and infinite dimension is the only some difference, or is there some 
Uh, so, so yeah, so, so the, so this type three one can only appear in, in the infinite dimensional case. Um, um, you, you can have type one also in the infinite dimensional case though. Um, so for example, one, one difference, um, they're, they're classified by the types of projection operators that they contain. Um, and so I think sort of the, the easiest way um, to say it is that this, in these, these sort of type one algebras, they have pure states on those algebras. Um, whereas for a type three, type three algebra, there, there, there are no pure states on that algebra. Um, yeah, um, right. Uh, hi, Sam. Yes. I have one question about uh, this section. When you say the entanglement in the statistic QFT, do you mean the entanglement between the left CFT and the right CFT? Uh, right. So, so, so here I'm imagining that I that I've broken. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm imagining that I've, I've broken up um, a QFT on some space time into uh, into subregions, and I want to talk about the entanglements between those two subregions. Okay. Then how do you uh, do the deep by partition in the gauges theory from the volume man type three algebra? Because I know that the people use the choice of a center uh, to uh, to the uh, to do the bipartition, but uh, I think uh, this theorem maybe just uh, is just correct, or we have a proof in the in the countable Hilbert space. Right. Um, right. So so the so so here um, here I guess I'm just I don't have any particular theory in mind. Um, there, there are some, there are some uh, general theorems that that suggest that uh, that these these local operator algebras are always of type three one. Um, so yeah, in in the, yes, in the um, in the gate in the, in the yeah in the gauge theory case, um, yes, you you have to um, you have these these center because the operator algebras are in these subregions are not what's called factors. They have a non-trivial center, yeah. um, and so here what I, what I mean by a type three one algebra is I'm imagining that it's it's some larger von Neumann algebra that contains type three one factors in its decomposition. Okay, so you can you can decomposition. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You can do a decomposition in that case. Yeah. Using the center. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Great. Um, and so now now I'll talk about sort of uh, uh, another important uh, result in, in algebraic quantum field theory, which is called half sided modular inclusion. So first, I'll just introduce a little bit of, of jargon that, that comes up in this algebraic quantum field theory language. Um, so suppose we have a von Neumann algebra M and some state it can act on that I'll denote by omega. Um, the, one says that omega is cyclic for M um, if the following is true. If we take all of these operators A in that algebra M and act them on the state, then we get some set of states and if that set of states is dense in the Hilbert space, we say omega is cyclic for M. And another thing that we can do um, is take all those operators in M, again, act them on this state omega and ask, okay, for which operators did we annihilate the state omega? Um, and if it happens that the only operator that annihilates the state omega is the zero operator, then we say omega is separating for M. So this is just some, some jargon, but it, it's, it's the way that you talk about highly entangled states um, in, in algebraic quantum field theory. So with these cyclic separating states, um, those are sort of like highly, very highly entangled states on these algebras. And so there's a very familiar example um, uh, of such a state, which is the Minkowski vacuum state on a Rindler algebra. The Minkowski vacuum is a cyclic and separating state for a Rindler algebra. Great. And so now um, in the case, when I have this, this cyclic and separating state, then I have Tamita Takisaki theory and I can start talking about modular flow. Um, so here uh, with, uh, with one of those states, so I'm imagining that I have some state omega um, and it's cyclic and separating for this, for this algebra M. Then there's another thing that we can consider which is called half-sided modular inclusion. So if I can find a sub-algebra N that's contained within this larger algebra M, such that the modular flow of n always keeps me inside of n. So it's contained in n for negative values of the parameter. This is called the half-sided modular inclusion. Then there are these theorems due to Borchers and Wiesbrock that say there exists this unitary group 
with a positive semi-definite generator. And moreover, this unitary group actually preserves this state omega that, that's used in its construction and in this definition of delta. And so this group generates new times. And so we're going to use this half-sided modular inclusion structure to generate new times. But it turns out that it's actually was shown by Borchers in 1998 that this structure is only possible for a type 3-1 von Neumann algebra. So we'll keep that in mind for a second, because um, in the black hole case, there's not an obvious choice of, of what, what this algebra will be. Um, so first, I'll just give an example of, the, of, um, of, of, of um, one of these half-sided modular inclusions. So what I've drawn here is, is again, a Rindler decomposition of Minkowski space. And imagine that I take this larger algebra M to be the algebra of operators in this right Rindler red. So in this red and purple region together, that whole region, then the modular flow is, is simply, is, is well known. It's just acts like a boost around this origin. So taking us along, you know, these Rindler time, these, uh, it, it moves us in Rindler time. Um, and so if, if I take a subalgebra here that's shifted in X minus by some, some direction, then I have a half-sided modular inclusion. That's because if, if I boost by, you know, if I boost by some negative amount, this algebra N maps within itself. It just maps within itself. And so we have this half-sided modular inclusion. And then the operator that, that Borchers and Wiesbrock guaranteed us that we would have actually turns out to just be a translation along this X minus direction. And so one thing to notice is that for, uh, for negative values of the parameter, if we evolve by this X minus translation by this operator, then this Rindler wedge, you know, it was moved within itself. It doesn't, it doesn't leave the Rindler wedge. But as soon as we start evolving by a positive value of, param of the parameter, we'll actually start to find operators in this future region with respect to that Rindler decomposition. Um, and you can play a similar game on the left side to generate the past region. So in particular, you can use this U of S to generate the future and past regions just from these right and left regions. Um, great. And so now we want to try to understand how can we do this in the black hole case. And so, it, as, as I mentioned, there's that theorem of, of Borchers that tells us we can only find these U of S evolution operators um, in the case that we have a type 3 1 von Neumann algebra. And so in the black hole case, we need to find that type 3 1 von Neumann algebra. And there's not an obvious choice, because if I take the full operator algebra on the right or the left CFT, those are type 1 von Neumann algebras. They're algebras of operators. They're bound, full bounded operator algebras on some Hilbert space. They're type 1 von Neumann algebras. So instead, um, instead we have to be uh, a bit more careful. And so instead, uh, we consider the algebra of single trace operators of, of, you know, of, the, of the CFT, um, and I'll call that A sub R, in the large n limit. So in the uh, large you want to elaborate the why this uh, CFT R and the L are type one. Right. Um, so so uh, yeah. So another way another way to uh, to say a, 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 to describe a type one uh, von Neumann algebra is that it is um, it's the yeah it's an algebra of operators um, on some some full Hilbert space. So if I take a Hilbert space and take all of the bounded operators on that Hilbert space. I get an operator algebra, and by definition, that operator algebra is always of type one. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a, a, another way to say it is that this type one uh, algebra has an irreducible representation on some Hilbert space, which you don't have in the other cases. Great. Um, and so, yeah, and so because those full operator algebras are type one, we have to instead uh, find another operator algebra that maybe can give us this, this, um, this, um, this, these evolution operators. Um, and so, so the, the sort of a natural place to look is at these, these algebras of single trace operators, which can be defined in this large n limit of the boundary theory. So imagining this boundary theory uh, as, as you know, some matrix theory of many, many, many degrees of freedom. Um, in, that, in that large n limit, we can define these algebra of single trace operators. And then we can take that, we can take all of those operators and act them on the thermal field double state between the two CFTs. And when we do that, it turns out that there's something called the GNS construction or Gelfand Neymark Siegel construction that shows that those um, that algebra acting on the states 
that actually has the structure of a Hilbert space. You can construct a Hilbert space out of that setup. Then we'll define M sub R to be the representation of the single trace uh, algebra on that a GNS Hilbert space. And we conjecture that M sub R is a type 3 1 von Neumann algebra. And so now I'll explain to you some support for that conjecture. So the first support comes from the complete spectrum of thermal correlation functions of single trace operators. So what this means is that if I look in the right CFT, if I take the two point function of, of two single trace operators in a thermal state, um, as long as I'm above the Hawking, the Hawking page temperature, what I'll, um, what I'll find is that those two point functions, um, if I take their Fourier transform to get the spectral function, that spectral function is supported on all values of CFT energy um, all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. Um, and so this is what we call a complete spectrum. Um, and this is related um, to the eigenvalue of, of that um, modular operator that I mentioned earlier, that operator delta. We can think of the eigenvalues of minus log delta as being those CFT energies. And so the fact that we're supported all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity shows us that the eigenvalues of delta lie on the full real line from a positive real line from zero to plus infinity. Um, and this is exactly what we expect to happen in a type three one von Neumann algebra where those eigenvalues of delta of, of that modular operator lie on the full positive real line um, for, for any choice of reasonable state. Great. The second support for the conjecture comes from the half-sided modular inclusion structure. So I'll show you in a, a little bit later that we actually do have this half-sided modular inclusion structure in that single trace algebra. And the simplest argument for, 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 um, for this conjecture is the duality with local bulk algebras. So um, here um, I can imagine that I, I, take the, I take my black hole geometry and I have the Hartle-Hawking state. Um, and if I act, you know, the operators in the exterior, um, in the exterior regions on that Hartle-Hawking state, I can build a Fox space um, in the bulk. So this is, you know, in, this is in the in the bulk field theory. Um, and when I do that, um, we know that that um, in that case, these operator algebras, which I'll call m tilde sub sub l in the left exterior of the black hole, and and m tilde sub r in the right exterior of the black hole. Those operator algebras are operator algebras on a subregion in some in some quantum field theory on curved space time, and in particular, due to these uh, due to these sort of general results in quantum field theory, those op subregion operator algebras are expected to be of type three one, and then we know um, we we know um, it's it's been established that those operator algebras are dual to these single trace operator algebras on the boundary, um, and so in particular. We can we can uh, argue from that from that bulk picture that that the, the, for in order for the duality to hold these single trace operator algebras must also be of type three one. Great, and so now I'll describe the uh, the construction of the evolution operators. Now that we have these type three one algebras, we can look for a half sided modular inclusion structure. And so remember to find that structure. We had to take our larger algebra, which now I'm taking to be all the single trace uh, operators on the right theory. We take that larger algebra and we need to find an appropriate subalgebra that's preserved under modular flow for a negative value of the parameter. And so um, first we'll have to digress a little bit into generalized free field theories. So in the large n limit, this algebra of single trace operators um, can be described by a generalized free field theory. Um, and so in general, those theorems of Borchers and Wiesbrock are existence theorems. They tell you that this group U of S exists, but they don't really tell you how to construct it. And constructing it in general is very hard. That requires you to know, uh, it's a hard process that requires you to know modular operators for strangely shaped regions and strongly coupled quantum field theory. But what we found is that um, from the, the properties of this U of S, that in generalized free field theories, there's actually a universal form of, of U of S. It can be described in a universal way that's completely fixed up to a phase factor. Um, and so because of that, in this generalized free field case, we could compute everything very explicitly. Um, and so now let me mention just a peculiarity of, of generalized free fields. 
So what I've drawn here is, is, is the causal diamond of, of some uh, spatial re region here in blue um, or in red. Um, and so we can imagine this as being the, the, causal, the causal diamond in some, uh, in some boundary field theory. Um, and so usually in quantum field theory, we have the equation of motion that would allow us to evolve all these operators here on, on this slice A2 down to those operators on this slice A1. And so we would say that those operator algebras are equivalent. And that's the case in usual quantum field theory. But for generalized free fields, there's actually no equation of motion satisfied by the field operators. And because of this, the algebras on, a, on this slice A1 and the algebras on A2 are actually inequivalent. And this is important because it allows us to find this half-sided modular inclusion structure. So here I'm drawing the boundary space-time in the BTZ case. So in the, in the BTZ case, the boundary is this Lorentzian cylinder. We have time going to minus infinity at the bottom, time going to plus infinity at the top, and then imagine identifying these left and right edges, wrapping us up into a cylinder. So um, what's crucially important for this generalized free field theory is that that generalized free field theory of boundary operators, operators on, on different time slices are actually, they're all independent of each other at any different at any different space-time points, those generalized free field operators are independent of each other. And so in particular, what that means is if I take the, the algebra of generalized free field operators supported below this critical, this, this critical value of time, then that's actually a proper subalgebra of the full algebra of, uh, um, of generalized free field operators. And that's because, uh, so usually in quantum field theory, we could just evolve um, using, using the Hamiltonian of evolve those operators all back uh, down to a single Cauchy slice. But for generalized free fields, we can't do this. And we have this proper subalgebra. And this means that we have a half-sided modular inclusion. Um, for one full copy of the boundary space time, when we put that in the thermal field double state, the modular flow acts as a boundary time translation. So it just moves us up and down this Lorentzian cylinder. And so in particular, if I take all the operators below some critical value, um, of time supported below that critical value, if I evolve by a negative value of time, then I'm still contained within that operator algebra. And so we have exactly that structure that we need, this structure of a half-sided modular inclusion. Um, and this means that we have those theorems of Borchers and Wiesbrock, and we can generate U of S from this choice of boundary subalgebra. And that is exactly, um, that is exactly um, the subalgebra whose flow I showed you earlier. Um, and so I mentioned that for these generalized free field uh, case, we can, we, this operator U of S is completely fixed. It has a universal form up to a phase. Um, and in order to compute that phase, um, in general, that's, that's a very difficult problem, but we can, conjecture, um, we can conjecture that the bulk dual of this sort of strange region on the boundary of operators supported only below a critical value of time is dual to this, this uh, region here in the exterior of the eternal ADS black hole that is shifted back in this crucial U coordinate by some finite amount. Um, and when you make that conjecture, what you find is that that arbitrary phase, um, that, ar that arbitrary phase, which is the only degree of freedom left to describe U of S in this generalized free field case, that phase can be computed from the phase shift of the bulk fields at the horizon here. And that's exactly by computing that phase and completely describing U of S, that's exactly where this picture that I showed much earlier came from. So this, we get a crucial U-like translation taking us from the right side across the horizon and into the interior um, from this construction. And similarly, those half-sided modular inclusions, they, you, know, you can also flip the signs on everything and describe a half-sided modular inclusion in the other direction. So you know, for example, what I've drawn here is all the operators supported above some critical value of time. Um, and then, you know, and then we have this half-sided modular inclusion with a positive value of the parameter. We can do the same construction. And this actually constructs for us a Kruskal V-like translation that takes us from the left exterior across the horizon and into the future interior. Um, and so in particular, um, it turns out there's actually an infinite number of choices. 
I can choose any, any function here on the cylinder as my cutoff surface. And if I take all the operators below that cutoff surface, then I get a half-sided modular inclusion in the negative direction. If I take all the ones above that surface, I get a half-sided modular inclusion in the positive direction. And so there's an infinite number of ways to generate these, em these emergent infalling times. Great. Um, so first of all, yes. uh, let me ask the previous, uh, in the previous three, you mentioned that this, uh, the algebra at the times like A1 and the A2 is different. Mm -hmm. So that is only particular case in the this uh, CFT dual to the black hole, or it is uh, true in any general holographic situation. Like uh, you can consider the holographic dual of the ADS space, which is a single CFT. Is it also still true that uh, this A1 and the A2 is inequivalent? The A1 means this generalized free field. Right. Yes. So, so in these, yeah, in the case that, um, in the case that you have this generalized free field theory on the boundary, mm -hmm. then it's always the case that those a one and a two are inequivalent. Um, even in the like a dual to the just a pure, I mean, the ADS space, not the black hole, but the right. So, so even even in the in the pure, yeah, even in the pure um, ADS case, um, once you, um, yeah. So if I if I'm um, yeah, so if I, if I want to sort of describe like, you know, a, a field propagating in pure ADS, um, then I describe that by single trace operators on just a single copy of the boundary in the vacuum state. Yes. Um, and what I find is that in the large N limits, um, that, that field operator can be described by these, these so-called generalized free fields. So if I take this single trace operator, it generates an algebra, and that algebra is, is equivalently described by, by generalized free fields. And because of that, it's that algebra has this property that those A1 and A2 slices, those algebras are inequivalent. So yes, e even in that vacuum case. But the, the, if we consider the unitary evolution, still is it inequivalent? Like a... Right, so, so, so what the crucial thing that, that's happening here is, is, is going, to, um, going to sort of this low energy description where, where I'm taking only the single trace algebra. So the full Hamiltonian, um, the yeah. So if I'm if I'm allowed to use the full Hamiltonian, um, then uh, of the CFT, then I can evolve those operators to each other. So yeah, because the CFT is just some is just some special kind of QFT. So I have the Hamiltonian, and I can evolve those operators to each other, and I lose this property. But what actually happens um, is is that um, that that Hamiltonian. Um, when I do the Hamiltonian evolution of a, of a single trace operator, um, basically because I had to exponentiate, um, because I had to exponentiate that e to the minus iht um, when I'm evolving that operator, I get an infinite number of terms um, in order to move a finite distance from a finite distance in time. Yeah, in order to move a finite amount in time, um, I have to take keep all of the terms in that whole series for that exponentiation. Um, and so in particular, that operator, um, that, that, that series does not converge as a single trace operator. Um, so, so the single trace operators are independent of each other. But in, in that case where, where we know, um, and, and so th this only happens in, in the large N limits um, because uh, yeah, outside of, outside of the, the large N limit, then I have to use the full boundary operator algebra, which does have this property that I can use the unitary evolution to get between slices. Thank you. And uh, will you also explain the meaning of the infinite number of choice in the next slide or? Uh, yeah, so I, yeah, so I wasn't going to say too much more about this, but um, what, one thing is that, um, so for example, what, one thing that, that we found is that this flow in the bulk, um, when, we're near the when we're near the horizon, it's, um, it's, it acts like this Kruskal U translation and it's uniform in all the transverse directions. Um, whereas if you chose a subalgebra like this on the boundary, then the dual bulk flow would presumably not be uniform in the transverse directions. Um, and, and so, and so, so there's many different way, there are many different bulk flows that you can, you can get and there, and there, there, uh, there is, um, and there, there may be a choice of boundary subalgebra that describes that flow, um, but the one that we only studied in detail 
Um, the only one we studied in detail is, is something like this that has this, this sort of flat cutoff surface. Um, but in principle, there are an infinite number of choices, um, an infinite number of flows that can be constructed by this machinery. Thank you. Great, thanks. A oh, question? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then what is the physical meaning of G for CFT interpretation or E? Do you have, so depending on these choices, you have different Gs. Yes, yes. Okay. So can I have some, so what is the current corresponding quantity in CFT for G in, in this bulk? Yeah. Yeah, have, right. Yeah, yes, please. Right, yes, yeah. So, so, um, so, so, yeah, so I guess, yeah, what, one thing I can say about, so, so from this, from the CFT perspective, G is just some operator that, that we can construct. Um, we think it, you know, it, it should, it should, it should correspond to some notion of sort of global, of, of global energy associated with that flow between different Cauchy slices in the bulk. Um, and so, so that's sort of the, the bulk interpretation. I guess from the boundary perspective, we, we don't have, um, yeah, we, we don't really have a great physical interpretation of, of what, what that should mean. So here, as far as you understand, you are considering only single trace operators. And if I, so so, so such a single trace operators can describe so all the physics of CFT in the large limit. Sorry for the, yeah, this element. Right, right. So, um, right, right. So, um, yeah. So in in this, yeah, in, in the, yeah, yeah. Um, Right in the in the in the sort of the strict lar large end limits, the, these sort of single trace operators are are all that you have left. Um, the uh, there'll, there'll be divergences associated with with, with uh, you know if I try to take something like like some multi trace operators, um, and 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 these these are sort of the operators that describe these these quantum fields propagating about some background. So can you have? So suppose I have some ADM Hamiltonian, some H and H mu. So is there a relation, direct relation with such quantity to G, global energy of the bulk, whatever you call for single trace operators? Or... Right. Yeah. So that. Yeah. That's that's um, right. So that's. Right. Yeah, that, that's a that's a good a good question. Um, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't looked at if there there is any um, connection with with ADM. So let me think. Right. So so. Um, right. So so here. Um, yeah. Here we're talking about the, this evolution. Um, yeah, between the, these global Cauchy slices uh, in, in the bulk, so sort of a, a global notion of evolution, um, and um, and I, I haven't, um, I, yeah. So so one one thing you could, you could imagine doing is is trying to actually construct this G between those two slices that we get out. You could try to just construct that in in the bulk um, quantum field theory. Um, and that that's not not something we have done. And, and I think if, if you did that, then then maybe you, you would be able to see how and if th this related to the ADM Hamiltonian. Um, but yeah, yeah, at the moment, I guess I don't have much to say about that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, I also have a question. Could you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. The question that your study is just to apply the summer time hypothesis to the generalized free theory. Um, oh, so, sorry, I missed something. Um, I mean, yeah. the, I think you you say that you can always uh, have emergent have an emergent time from the modular flow. I think it's a very similar to the summer time hypothesis. They also mentioned that you can always, if you have a polymer algebra, you can always have the emergent time from the modular flow. 
Oh, right. Yeah. So, 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 so the modular flow gives you, um, yeah. So the, so the modular flow is, is some sort of notion, notion of time because, you know, it has this, this, um, you have this, this modular Hamiltonian, yes. um, and, and, and you have this, you have, you know, you have this automorphism of the algebra. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think it's a, it can be more general from the summer time hypothesis. So I think that you just do the application to the generalized free theory. Is this correct? Oh, so right. So, so in, in particular, right. So, um, so our our, um, our generator G, this this generator of of our flow, it is not um, it is not a modular operator. It, it's not a modular Hamiltonian for any um, for any modular operator. Uh -huh. um, it's it, it actually it turns out it's a it's a difference between two different modular Hamiltonians. Yes. Um, right. And so in, in particular. Um, Right. So, so in, in particular, if I have, um, right, if I have this, you know, if I have this algebra and some cyclic and se separating state, I can always, I can always find the modular flow. Yes. Um, but, but what I, what I, what I can't always find is something like this generator G. Um, yes. That, that, yeah, that, that, that has these, these properties that, that I'm interested in. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I think that you, 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 you realize the more details for the uh, summertime hypothesis. Is this correct? I say you you do the more detail because you work in the, the in a particular theory. Um, right. So so um, so so these um, yeah these generators um, so so you, so you, yeah so you, you can you can show that um, when you have this half sided modular inclusion structure you can always construct yeah. this generator. But yes. but describing it is very difficult. Um, yeah, 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 sure, sure. If you do not consider particular theories, how to describe it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, okay. So I just try to understand how they work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. So so yeah, so it's yeah, so it's so if you have this half side modular inclusion structure, then you'll be guaranteed that this generator exists and that those evolution operators U of S exist, but they're yeah. very hard to describe. I will have a discussion because your paper does not cite the high summer time hypothesis, this original paper. So I'm confused about whether your paper is a new thing. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah, maybe we can talk about that that Thank after. You. Um yeah, yeah. <laughs> great, thanks. Um great. Um okay, so now I'll just sort of uh, quickly com compute uh, conclude. With, with a few applications um, of, of, um, of, of these results. So first, I just want to talk quickly about, um, about uh, UV divergences. So here I'm imagining now that, that we're actually in that case where we're taking global ADS. So we're taking one copy of the conformal field theory um, on, you know, here, you know, for example, on the Lorentzian cylinder, and here's a time slice. Um, and and in, in that case, then I want to consider now, instead of an algebra of operators on, on the full boundary space time, I want to consider the algebra of operators on some subregion of that boundary space time. Um, and so, so even you know, without having to go to single trace operators and all of that, the, the operator algebra on that small subregion of the boundary space time is already, uh, is already going to be of type 3, 1. Um, and in particular, this is this is something that's famously reflected in the Ryutaki Nagi formula. So in that case, you know, if I take this uh, the entanglement entropy of this boundary region R, that's this segment of the circle here, then what I find is that there's a, the, the because that operator algebra is of type three one, there's a divergence in the entanglement entropy, and that divergence is reflected in the bulk by the divergence in the area of this Ryutaki Nagi surface um, near the boundary. So this is this is uh, you know one. Uh, one aspect of this UV IR correspondence. Um, but now, uh, actually, this large n limit gives rise to a new type. Of, so, that's, uh, so that's sort of the, the, the Ryutaki and Agi um, is reflecting that um, type three structure due to going to a subregion. But there's a new type three structure associated with the large n limit. And this additional, this additional structure is actually reflected by the UV divergences of the bulk entanglement entropy Across the Ryutaki and Aoki service here in the bulk, um, and so so this um, is sort of a, a new interpretation of that of that bulk divergence, this divergence in the entanglement entropy of bulk fields. Um, another application 
is, is, is that you can show that a sharp black hole horizon um, is, is only possible in the, in the large n limit of the boundary theory. So remember that we have this infalling, uh, descrip this description of an infalling observer, um, and it involves both left and right degrees of freedom. It's positive semi-definite. Uh, one can show that, that, um, that this sharp horizon um, having that, you know, non-zero commutators um, before the horizon or, or zero commutators before the horizon and non-zero after having a sharp horizon structure retires, uh, requires type three one. Um, and that's only possible in the end going to an infinity limit because at finite n, we only have access to those right and left CFT algebras, which are of type one. Uh, and then finally, as we discussed briefly earlier, there's the black hole singularity. Um, and this is something that we still don't understand uh, uh, particularly well, uh, and, and we'd be very interested to understand better. Um, but one thing to notice is here in this bulk picture, you know, here's this bulk picture of the flow in the large mass limit. Those trajectories hit the singularity, um, and they hit the singularity at some finite value of the parameter. And this should be indi indicating that the emergent type 3 1 algebra cannot be extended indefinitely. Um, so, so, so because this, this um, type three one algebra emerges in, in the large end limit, somehow this singularity um, is, is how gravity is reflecting its emergent nature. Great. Um, and so I'll just conclude with some future directions. So one thing we'd like to better understand the emergence of this type three one structure at large n in the large end limit. So in particular, we'd like to study specific examples of, of specific holographic theories and, and you know, perhaps maybe the, the SYK model um, as, as a very simple example um, and, and see exactly how this type three one structure emerges in those specific cases where we have, uh, have a good deal of control. We'd like to better understand the role of the bulk singularities and their resolutions in the boundary theory. Um, we'd like to apply this framework to emergent symmetries in SYK and horizon symmetries um, and finally, we'd like to study the emergence of the black hole interior in the, in the single-sided case for a single-sided black hole, rather than this eternal black hole that we've studied in this work. Um, so thanks very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer more questions. Thank you very much for a very good, nice talk. Uh, please ask your questions. Let me ask uh, one question first. Uh, here you consider like a two, like a, you mentioned this SYK model. Mm -hmm. And uh, people usually work on the Euclidean, but uh, of course you can do the Laurentian, but uh, mm -hmm. usually work on the Euclidean. And uh, you have uh, to couple the SYK model in the Euclidean. Maybe you can also think of the entangled states, double states, mm -hmm. but uh, it's a Euclidean. So in that case, can you also still find this kind of uh, evolution operator in the Euclidean SYK? Or... So it's uh, like a, from the point of the black hole, it sounds like it's a Lorentzian physics, right? Because uh, right, yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. so. Is it possible to work on? So my question is uh, the Laurentian, the SYK model in the Laurentian is uh, mandatory or in the Euclidean SYK, is it still possible to see the some feature or? Right, yeah, so, so that, that's a good question. So, so in particular, so in, yeah, so in the, let me see. So in the, in the SYK case, so, so in particular, um, Right. So, 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 in particular, um, what we what we need to study in that case um, is is um, is taking sort of right. Yeah. So, so in that case, we have the we have the operator algebra at some value of time, and then and then we have a Hamiltonian, and we can evolve, um, you know, in Euclidean time or in or in Lorentzian time. Um, and so, in in particular. Um, and these sort of questions, these sort of questions, I guess, are are, are more about the na the nature of that operator algebra itself, yes. um, in in uh, in in the large end limit. So so starting with just the the um, so if you can yeah starting with just the Hamiltonian um, and the operators um, the individual operators um, at time zero for example, um, 
then uh, then yeah, we, we would need to study um, sort of how, uh, how, how that operator algebra behaves in the large end limit and, and in particular, um, how, um, how the um, sort of how the, the correlation functions of, of the Hamiltonian itself and with, um, and with local uh, sort of those, those, uh, those Majorana fermion degrees of freedom, uh, how, how those, uh, yeah, how, how those operators uh, behave and how their correlation functions behave. Um, in, in, or, in order to study this, so um, so I think yeah. So 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 um, so for example, yeah. like uh, here you talk about the black hole, but uh, you uh, people also study that is you bleed a wormhole. There, mm -hmm. what does this yield like a gener generator some new time uh, play role in that equilibrium wormhole? So, if we apply that case, this uh, your generator on the Euclidean warmer states mm -hmm. to the SYK couple each other, and they if they consider the Euclidean warmer, what happens? Yeah, that that's a good question. So so um, it, it's not something I, I've thought about um, too much. So so I I can't uh, yeah I can't say uh, yeah I can't say for sure. Um, right. Right. So yeah. So I guess. Um, Yeah, I guess I guess yeah. So in in that case, um, right? If you can construct, um, right? If yeah, if you can construct this this generator, I guess yeah. So if you can show that this, um, yeah, I get yeah. Maybe maybe I'll just say I, I yeah. I haven't thought about that case too much, so I, so I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, is there any other question? Uh, if not, let's thank speaker again for a nice talk. Thanks. Yeah. Let me stop the recording.